through the structure of scientific revolutions by Thomas Kuhn, I find that I have a lot more highlighting in chapter 12 on the resolution of revolutions, and uh, a lot less here in chapter 11 on the invisibility of revolutions. So um, we may have some real fun in chapter 12. Let's see if we can make this a short video on why in chapter 11 Kuhn says scientific revolutions tend to be invisible. And by that we mean when we look back on the history of science, we tend not to notice that its progress that got us here has involved a number of scientific revolutions where we not only add knowledge to knowledge, but we take one theory and we discard it altogether and we bring in a new one to replace it. We change our way of looking at the world. A change of perspective, not just adding some knowledge, but an actual change of how we even think about the world is uh, part of scientific progress. And this is often not noticed. Even scientists don't notice. Philosophers of science don't notice. Lay people thinking about science don't notice. Why is that? Let's go to the text. We must still ask how scientific revolutions close, and that will be chapter 12. Before doing so, however, a last attempt to reinforce conviction about their existence in nature seems called for. That will be chapter 11. Before clarifying how a scientific revolution ends, we have to uh, clarify uh, the argument that scientific revolutions happen. I've so far tried to display revolutions to display revolutions by illustration, and the examples could be multiplied ad nauseum. But clearly, most of them, which were deliberately selected for their familiarity, have customarily been viewed not as revolutions but as additions to scientific knowledge. So far, he's uh, largely relied on examples from the history of science, and. These examples of scientific revolutions have often been viewed as just adding knowledge to knowledge, not as the change in perspective, the rejection of one theory, uh, take away old knowledge or what we thought was knowledge and replace it with a new theory. Uh, no, it's just thought to have been cumulative, add knowledge to knowledge. It was really a revolution, but we misunderstand it. And for that reason, he can't clarify his case just by adding more examples. If we were misunderstanding the last ones, we'll misunderstand the next ones. No, he has to clarify something about the examples. You could almost say he needs to make sure we have the right paradigm for thinking about paradigm change. That same view could equally well be taken of any additional illustrations, and these would probably be ineffective. I suggest that there are excellent reasons why revolutions have proved to be so nearly invisible. Both scientists and laymen take much of their source of creative scientific activity from an authoritative source that systematically disguises, partly for important functional reasons, the existence and significance of scientific revolutions. There is an authoritative source. Science works with authority. Um, it's not pure reason, uh, questioning, skepticism, critical thinking, independent thought, however you want to describe that. Uh, science often does rely on authority in some respects, some respects. What authority are we talking about? There is an authoritative source that makes scientific revolutions that have happened in the past almost invisible and um, almost forces us to think of them as um, accumulated step-by-step um, -step increases in knowledge. What authoritative source are we talking about? Only when the nature of that authority is recognized and analyzed can one hope to make historical example fully effective. But what authority are we talking about? Next paragraph. As the source of authority I have in mind principally textbooks of science together with both the popularizations and the philosophical works modeled on them. Textbooks are the problem, except it's not really simply a problem. It's, it's a situation. Uh, it's problematic in some ways, but not in others. Uh, it's perfectly reasonable for scientific textbooks to do what they do. And what they do, um, well, is problematic in some respects, but also perfectly reasonable on the whole. What do they do? They assume the perspective of normal science. That's how they work. A scientific textbook presents the currently dominant paradigms and inducts the student of science, the, uh, whether that's the, the, the child studying uh, uh, physics in, in grade seven or something, uh, or whether it's the PhD student being inducted with the super advanced uh, physics textbook into uh, the practice of physics um, at some Ivy League university or something. At any level, the, the, the student being inducted into science or being introduced to science uses a textbook that teaches the currently dominant paradigms. And uh, it's a textbook that adopts the perspective of normal science, where we assume that the, the way we're thinking about the world is correct and that uh, there's no need to change how we're thinking about the world. We just need to fill in some of the gaps 
add knowledge to knowledge. Okay, so um, uh, this perspective makes it hard to see that we actually got here not by simply adding knowledge to knowledge, but by <laughs> some changes of perspective and some discarding of old theories, replacing them with incompatible ones that um, gave us the current paradigms we have. All three of these categories, um, the textbooks, the popularizations, and the philosophical works modeled on the textbooks, all three of these categories have one thing in common. Here's a description of how uh, scientific textbooks and things under their influence, popularizations of science and philosophical works modeled on them. These textbooks and the things influenced by them adopt the perspective of normal science. This sentence is key for understanding that. They address themselves, scientific textbooks, address themselves to an already articulated body of problems, data, and theory, most often to the particular set of paradigms to which the scientific community is committed at the time they're written. Textbooks themselves aim to communicate the vocabulary and syntax of a contemporary scientific language. Popularizations attempt to describe these same applications in a language closer to that of everyday life. And philosophy of science, particularly that of the English-speaking world, analyzes the logical structure of the same complicated body of scientific knowledge. So all three record the stable outcome of past revolutions, and thus display the basis of the current normal scientific revolution. To fulfill their function, they need not provide authentic information about the way in which those bases were first recognized and then embraced by the profession. There's no need for a science textbook or the popularizations of science that are built on them or the philosophy of science that is largely a function of, of um, which largely functions as a commentary on the, the state of science in those textbooks. This sentence got too large. Let's start this sentence again. The science textbooks, as, as well as the popularizations of science that rely on the textbooks and the philosophy of science that analyzes the things that are in the textbooks, these three things all present a normal scientific perspective, not science at the time of revolution, not science at the time of crisis preceding revolution. What they reflect is the results of whatever are the most recent scientific revolutions. Uh, they record the outcome, the stable outcome of past revolutions and they display the basis of the current normal scientific tradition, and there's no need for them to explain how we got here by, to some extent, revolution. I think rather than trying to state the why this is more clearly in my own words, I better, I better let Kuhn keep going. Uh, here in our third edition, uh, University of Chicago Press, let's turn the page, page 138. For reasons that are both obvious and highly functional, science textbooks refer only to that part of the work of past scientists that can easily be viewed as contributions to the statement and solution of the text's paradigm problems. Science textbooks are presenting current scientific theory, which means they're adopting the perspective of the currently dominant scientific paradigms, which means that these science textbooks are going to look at the history of science. They're going to present to the student the history of science only in order to make the case for the current paradigm. And that means, that means that, of course, they're only going to be able to present what looks like cumulative step-by-step -step, uh, additions to knowledge. In order to make the case for the current paradigm, uh, you need to build your argument for the way the world is right now. And that doesn't involve uh, a change in perspective uh, that's not based purely in reason. No, that means you present the experiments, you present uh, uh, the questions, the challenges, the puzzles, the theories, the predictions, and the confirming experiments that establish the currently dominant scientific paradigm uh, as the well-established theory that it is. That's how a science textbook has to work in service of the contemporary paradigm. And I don't think Kuhn thinks there's anything, strictly speaking, wrong with that. It's quite reasonable. It's quite, uh, what's the word he uses? Functional. Uh, it's a very practical way for science, scientific textbooks, to be written. It's how normal science works. It does, however, have this uh, problematic aspect that it obscures the history of science that we got here largely by uh, scientific revolution. Partly by selection and partly by distortion, and the scientists of earlier ages are implicitly represented as having worked upon the same set of fixed problems and in accordance with the same set of fixed canons 
that the most recent scientific revolution uh, that the most recent revolution in scientific theory and method has made seem scientific. No wonder the textbooks and the historical tradition they imply have to be rewritten after each scientific revolution, etc., etc. Oh, uh, no wonder that, as they are rewritten, science once again comes to seem largely cumulative, etc. But scientists are more affected by the temptation to rewrite history, partly because the results of scientific research show no obvious dependence upon the historical context of the inquiry, and partly because, except during crisis and revolution, the scientist's contemporary position seems so secure. The contemporary position of a scientist as someone who holds a particular way of thinking about the world, a particular paradigm, like uh, Newtonian physics in one era, Einstein in another, um, uh, perhaps uh, something more complex now. Uh, uh, let, let's not go as far as post-quantum mechanics. Um, Einstein in one era, or, or Newton in another. Um, uh, classical gradualistic Darwinism in one era, and uh, something else, uh, Neo-Darwinianism after I think it was 1959, and so, um, oh, well, punctuated equilibrium I think is, is a more recent uh, development in those theories. Um, uh, heliocentrism, geocentrism, all these things. Okay, um, the, uh, the scientist's contemporary position as interpreting the world according to such a paradigm seems quite secure. That's the dominant paradigm. It's been established because it explains a lot. It can make some predictions. Those predictions turn out well. The scientific theory has, to that extent, been uh, confirmed by uh, human experience, uh, controlled experimentation, blah, 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 etc., etc. From the pers in the, a time of normal science, the perspective of normal science seems pretty well established. So, of course, in presenting Introducing the, the, the current progress of science, it seems necessary to a scientist writing a science textbook to make that case, to show how we got here, and that means we're going to largely ignore largely ignore the fact that what got here, what got us here to this point of scientific progress was largely uh, some revolutionary changes of paradigms. It wasn't simply uh, we had an old theory and we built on it and made some uh, some progress and have the new theory we have now. No, it was we had an old theory, we threw it away altogether. We didn't just um, go forward in scientific progress, we went backwards, we rejected what we used to think we know uh, and replaced it with a new way of thinking. Kuhn gives some examples on page 139. Let's look at the example from uh, Newton. Newton wrote that Galileo had discovered that the constant force of gravity produces a motion proportional to the square of the time. In fact, Galileo's kinematic theorem does take that form when embedded in the matrix of Newton's own dynamical concepts, but Galileo said nothing of the sort. What Newton said Galileo said was not something Galileo had said. Rather, Galileo had certain insights that when recontextualized in a Newtonian theory, said what Newton said, Galileo said. Newton's account, skipping a bit, Newton's account hides the effect of a small but revolutionary reformulation in the questions that scientists ask about motion, as well as in the answers they felt able to accept. Uh, but it is just this sort of change that accounts far more than novel empirical discoveries for the transition from Aristotelian to Galilean, from Galilean to Newtonian dynamics. Uh, by disguising such changes, the textbook tendency to make the development of science linear hides a process that lies at the heart of the most significant episodes of scientific development. The most significant episodes of scientific development are revolutionary. Uh, they are not cumulative additions to knowledge. Uh, we, we keep going back to the first chapter of this book, don't we? Uh, the preceding examples display each within the context of a single revolution, the beginnings of a reconstruction of history that is regularly completed by post-revolutionary science texts. That, that's key. Uh, scientific textbooks written after a revolution are the final stage in the revolution. But in that completion, more is involved than a multiplication of the historical misconstructions illustrated above. Those misconstructions render revolutions invisible. 
The arrangement of the still visible material in science text implies a process that, if it existed, would deny revolutions of function. Now, again, there is something problematic about this. The way scientific textbooks are written uh, in support of the current paradigms of normal science means that they just present what they need to 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 support the current scientific paradigm. And that's just fine and dandy as far as it goes. It's perfectly functional. It's very practical. There's nothing... I don't think Kuhn would say... Uh, well, let me not say there's nothing wrong with it. Let me, not, let me just say that I don't think Kuhn is saying that it's simply wrong. But there is something wrong with it, or at least there's a problematic aspect of it. It does make it harder for us to see that a lot of the past scientific progress that got us here was scientific revolutions. All right. Um, I'm sorry. This video is too long. I need to shut up. Perhaps I'll see you next week talking about uh, chapter 12, which uh, will hopefully be much more interesting. There's, uh, there's Kuhn's commentary on Karl, Karl Popper in the near future.